Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Barnard Center for Research on Women's 47th Annual Scholar and Feminist Conference, which is entitled Living in Madness, Decolonization, Creation, and Healing. Tonight's event, Willful Subjects, Decolonizing the Psychiatric Institution, is the first in our series this spring. My name is Miriam Neptune, and I am the Senior Associate Director here at BCRW. For audio description, I am a brown-skinned, cisgendered Black woman with locks, wearing silver disc earrings, shaped, silver-shaped, uh, sorry, disc-shaped earrings, and a scarf. I am in an office at Barnard College with white walls and a bookshelf behind me. I want to start by acknowledging, acknowledging that Barnard College sits on the unceded lands of the Lenape people. The Lenape lived in Lenape Hoking, the area we call New York City, for thousands of years before Dutch settlers forced them to disperse to places as far as Oklahoma, Texas, and Ontario, Canada, where they continue to fight to preserve their cultural lineage as the Delaware Nation. Displacement is a kind of violence, and this conference seeks to name and confront maddening conditions such as displacement that have a real impact on human survival and mental wellness. I would like to think that the entire conference gives us an opportunity and a space to imagine how our minds and hearts would thrive if we were to live in a future without uprooting without occupation and incarceration, without statelessness and fear of genocide. I wanna thank all of the BCRW staff involved in this conference and making all of the fantastic programming at BCRW possible. That includes our director, Elizabeth Castelli, creative director, Hope Dector, Sophie Kreitzberg, our post-baccalaureate fellow, and Pam Phillips, our senior program assistant. Thanks to BCRW research assistant, Eve Glazier, for live tweeting and supporting our Q&A tonight. But I wanna emphasis that th emphasize that this particular program would have been impossible without the creativity, research, and skillful outreach work of our program and communications manager, Avi Cummings. And thanks also to Vani Natarajan for their contributions to conference planning. We are grateful for the ASL interpretation provided by Glashanda Lawyer and William Mendez Gallardo from Coco Language Advocacy and Consulting. A live transcript will be available on our YouTube page and live captions are provided by Joshua Ed Edwards from Total Caption. Finally, before we begin, I would like to provide an advisory about the topics covered in this series. The purpose of this conference is to explore the construction of madness or mental illness as a social pathology and as a felt experience. We are highlighting ways that scholars, survivors, clinicians, artists, and abolitionists have deconstructed mental health systems. We are also aware that mental health and wellness can be both a personal and collective experience. experience and that there are many structures and practices that individuals may seek out, engage, and create in order to survive. This series is not seeking to vilify or prescribe specific forms of medical care, ritual healing, self-help, mutual aid, or any other mode of relief. You may find that some of the content presented tonight can be triggering due to the depiction or description of harmful acts violence, and systemically oppressive practices. We encourage you to allow yourself the space to interact with this content within your level of comfort. There are many ways to get support if you're feeling overwhelmed, including talking to people in your community or network of care. We're providing a link to the Fireweed Collective's crisis toolkit in case it is helpful to you. So as we begin the series and get our bearings, it seems fitting that we start with a conversation about psychiatric institutions and institutionalizing logics. Our four speakers have examined the politics and practices of psychiatry and psychotherapy 
with a focus on radical agency and collective opposition practiced by clinicians, incarcerated people, and people otherwise subjected to violence. I'm excited that our conversation is moderated tonight by BCRW collaborator and friend, Anne Pellegrini. Anne is professor of performance studies and social and cultural analysis at NYU, and also a licensed psychoanalyst. Welcome, Anne. Thank you so much, Miriam. It's just a pleasure to be here. Um, at remote events, time and space are multiple. So good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all of you tuning into this panel on willful subjects, decolonizing the psychiatric institution. I'll shortly tell you a bit about the format of this event, but first in keeping with BCRW's commitment to accessibility, we've asked each of the participants in this panel to offer a visual description of themselves, which Miriam just modeled. So here is my own self description. I do gender queer and have white skin with freckles and short dark brown hair with some very distinguished flecks of gray. I'm wearing a black polo shirt with electric yellow collar and a black suit jacket. My background is blurred. Okay, the format for our panel is as follows. Each presenter will speak for up to 12 minutes. At the end of their formal presentations, we'll have approximately 20 to 25 minutes for questions and answers. I'll kick things off by offering a question to the panelists, but there'll also be space for the audience to ask questions, and you're invited to pose a question to a specific speaker or to the entire panel. Miriam Neptune and Avi Cummings have beautifully curated this event and have shared some open-ended questions with each of the panelists in advance, inviting them to use any part of these questions as springboard for their prepared remarks. Here are the questions that they posed to our speakers. How do the psi sciences or medicalized practices of diagnosis and therapeutic intervention emerge from or interact with settler colonial projects, occupation, the prison industrial complex, fascism, nationalism, and or other forms of necropolitics at the particular site of your research? Describe how resistance is enacted by the individuals and or groups you center in your work how that has come about and what futures, psychic spaces or possibilities are created or preserved. Where and how does willful subjectivity flourish or persist? And what is the afterlife of resistance? And finally, Avi and Miriam note, we are profoundly aware that providers and practitioners are also subject to the conditions of occupation, repression, confinement, and that having a particular kind of power does not produce transcendence. In a clinical or therapeutic relationship, a practitioner might be confronted with their own pain, suffering, unfreedom. How have clinicians, consumer survivor activists, and others you've encountered in your research navigated that tension? And we're also thinking of the ways that people in movements toward abolition and ending occupation can be impacted by assaults on their mental well being or find themselves more damaged by the work they're trying to do. So what are the ways that you are thinking through this problem in your own communities of practice or scholarship? So you already have a sense of the richness and complexity ahead in our conversation. So let's get to it. We have four amazing speakers and to save time rather than read out their full biographies, um, Sophie will be dropping their bios into the chat box for us. Uh, we'll hear first from Camille Robsis, who is professor of French and history at Columbia University. Professor Robsis. Thanks so much, and, um, and so I wanna begin by thanking the Barnard Center for Research on Women, especially Miriam for this invitation. Uh, I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity to think about these questions um, with my co-panelists and, and with the audience tonight. Uh, in terms of the visual description, I'll say that I am um, a half French, half Mexican scholar with curly hair and that I'm wearing a black shirt and I'm sitting in my apartment close to Columbia University. So hello, uh, good night or good morning <laughs> to everyone. Um, Sophie, can you share my slides, please? I wanted to... Yeah, great, so thank you. So um, what I wanted to do today was tell you about a movement that I just finished writing about in this book that came out last spring, a movement called Institutional Psychotherapy. 
um, because it's a movement that thought a lot about decolonizing, not just the psychiatric institution, but politics and society as a whole. So first, a little bit of uh, the historical context in which this movement emerged, because I think the context shaped the ideas and the practices of institutional psychotherapy um, in really fundamental ways. So institutional psychotherapy was born in, during the Second World War in a small village in central France called Saint Alban. The context of the war, and more specifically the experience of fascism, was crucial for bringing together the cast of characters who first practiced institutional psychotherapy and laid its theoretical foundations. Now, as many of you know, probably, the Third Reich openly embraced eugenics and the forced euthanasia of the cognitively disabled. This was known as Action T4, and it resulted in, in around 300,000 deaths. What is less well known, however, is what was going on in France during the same time, where psychiatric hospitals were letting their patients die of cold, of hunger, or of lack of care. And there's been a couple of books on this question, on this question in recent years. These are two examples um, of historians who have referred to this practice as a, a soft extermination that resulted in around 40,000 patients dying in psychiatric hospitals. So the doctors and the nurses and the staff that worked at Saint Alban during the war were all painfully aware of this reality. And so their first goal was to hoard enough food to feed their patients and basically survive the war. But along the way, they were joined by poets, artists, philosophers, and political activists who shared their interest in madness and who helped them to radically rethink the practical and theoretical bases of psychiatric care. For all of them, fascism and the war had made clear the extent to which the political and the psychic were interconnected. Not only was the murder of the physically and mentally disabled central to the Nazi project of social regeneration, but fascism, authoritarianism, and collaboration were clearly not only political choices. They required a particular state of mind. So the, the way they framed it, the, the kind of the first, the founding fathers of institutional psychotherapy was that alienation was always social and psychic at once, right? So they, they said you needed to understand alienation, you needed Marx with Freud, not Marx or Freud, but, but kind of thinking the political and the psychic together. So for institutional psychotherapy, psychiatry needed, needed to abandon its ideal of scientific neutrality, detachment, and objectivism. And this was really still kind of prevalent in mainstream psychiatry. And it needed to embrace its, its political nature if it wanted to avoid being complicit with genocidal practices. So I'll return to these questions later, but for the let me tell you a little bit about one of the most important theorists of institutional psychotherapists, um, and his name is François Tosquelles. Tosquelles was a Catalan psychiatrist who was born in Reus in 1912, south of Barcelona. And he was one of the early founders of a political group called the PUM. You see in the slide here um, uh, the, what, it's, what the word stands for. Um, it was a political group that was born in the interwar years that advocated federalism, decentralization, worker solidarity, and self-management. And it was especially critical of Stalinism and a, a, of the kind of mainstream communist politics and the anti-democratic, authoritarian, and bureaucratic turn that the Soviet Union had taken during the 1930s. In parallel to his political activism, Tosquelles attended medical school and he chose to specialize in psychiatry. He was one of the early readers of Freud um, in Barcelona and especially of Lacan. Um, he was especially interested in the early Lacan, which is the, the, the Lacan that we tend to read less um, in the U.S. today, but he was um, the, the more medical Lacan, Lacan the, psychi the psychiatrist Lacan. Um, and what Tosquets was particularly interested in was Lacan's idea that psychosis needed to be understood um, beyond the brain, that it needed to be understood in relation to what he called the formation of a particular personality. So you needed to think about the patient's childhood, the conceptual structures of the delirium, the drives and intentions behind social behavior. In other words, um, what Tuskeyes and institutional psychotherapists were interested in was in thinking the self in all of its social complexity, not just as a kind of question of, of brain structure, but of, of, of social environment. 
1936, Tosquelles fought in the Spanish Civil War and eventually, like many other Spanish Republicans, um, he ended, he fled um, Spain after Franco won the war and he was placed in this concentration camp in the southwest of France. Conditions in the camp were dire. Several of the refugees died of hunger, disease, exhaustion. Other were, others were driven to suicide. They were amassed, as you can see in this picture, in overcrowded barracks surrounded by barbed wire, electrical projectors, and surveillance posts. And Tosquet repeated throughout his life that it was this concentrationist or carceral environment that led him to set up a psychiatric service within the camp. And so this is him. Um, you see him here with his with his friends um, who he recruited to help him basically uh, provide psychiatric help for the for the prisoners. Um, and he organized all kinds of activities like concerts, plays, um, uh, publications. And he learned two important lesson, lessons from his work in the camp. The first was that psychiatry could be practiced anywhere, even in the mud, as he said. And the second was that when you needed, when you treated a patient, you needed to treat the social environment as well. So you needed to cure the camp, you needed to cure the hospital, the institution at the same time as you cured the patient. These were the kinds of principles that guided institutional psychotherapy at Saint Alban and beyond. In other words, one way to summarize institutional psychotherapy or the kind of project of it would be to ask whether psychiatry could imagine within the limited confines of a hospital, a philosophy, a social theory, and a clinical practice that could prevent the chronic reappearance of these political and psychic concentrationisms. So how can we rethink rework and remap institutions to prevent them from becoming authoritarian, hierarchical, oppressive, right? And so, so this is somewhat abstract, but let me give you just a, to conclude a few examples of the kinds of practical experiments that, that these doctors set up because they, the practice and the theory were really intertwined. Um, to desalinate the patients, the hospital and the psychiatric profession and the community at large, you needed to begin very simply at the level of architecture. So you can see in this picture, this is the hospital and the walls. Um, the first step was to basically tumble down the walls that separated the hospital. So they gave the patients some hammers and they took down the walls. They also separated the walls that divided each cell so that everybody slept in one big common room. Similarly, institutional psychotherapy eliminated uniforms and medical blouses so that you could no longer tell who was a doctor, a nurse, or a patient. And this forced you to, what they said, explode fixed roles, but also to consider the singularity of each patient's illness. Every day was organized around a series of social activities. So these are some posters um, of the kinds of activities that happened at St. Alban. You'll see that there was theater, um, cinema, uh, sport activities, balls, um, you know, all kinds of, 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 of activities that were supposed to, um, to basically recreate a social network. Um, there was a lot of meetings where everybody could propose an idea, an activity, and everything was open to discussion. The goal was to facilitate new transferential constellations and to produce new commons, and ultimately to turn the hospital into what they called a healing collective. Institutional psychotherapy had many um, followers, but I'll just mention two names since, oh, so sorry, this is one example of the, the kind of art that was produced in the, in, within the hospital. There was many examples of this. One of the followers of institutional psychotherapy, someone for whom it was very important, was Franz Fanon, um, who was a medical resident at Saint Alban. The kinds of experiments that Tosquelles and his colleagues had set up at Saint Alban, the results they were getting, confirmed many of the hypotheses that Fanon had put forth in his early work on race and racism, including um, black skin, white masks. So Fanon brought institutional psychotherapy to North Africa, where he continued to work with psychotic patients and wrote some of his most important political texts there, including The Wretched of the Earth. So I think it's very interesting to think of the ways in which institutional psychotherapy was literally intertwined um, from a theoretical standpoint, but also at the very concrete level of production with Fanon's more political work. The second example is Jean Ouri, who was also an intern at Saint Alban after the war. And Ouri was famous for opening the Clinic of Laborde um, in 1953. Laborde in particular provided a home for the philosopher, psychoanalyst, and political activist Félix Guattari. Um, 
in and the book that you see here, Anti Oedipus, was what Guattari co-wrote with with his friend and colleague Gilles Deleuze, which you could also read as a kind of philosophical complement to institutional psychotherapy, as a manual to combat social and psychic alienation. The term they use in their book is Oedipalization. So um, I think just to conclude, um, Foucault, when Foucault wrote in the preface to Anti-Oedipus, he referred to Anti-Oedipus as a book of ethics. Um, its goal was to convince its readers to give up their attachment to authority, to oppression in their practices of everyday life. And this is, the, I think, the important question that Foucault asks. How does one keep uh, from being a fascist, even especially when one believes uh, oneself to be a revolutionary militant? How do we rid our speech and our acts, our heart and our pleasures of fascism? How do we ferret the fascism that is ingrained in our behavior? So even though institutional psychotherapy was born in reaction to the historical fascism of Hitler, of Franco, of Vichy, um, I think it also tried to give us tools to better understand the, the kind of libidinal aspect nature of all politics, um, not just right-wing politics, but politics more generally. If the carceral environment of, of psychiatric hospitals or concentration camps could be transformed into these spaces of psychic healing and renewed communal bond, then all institutions, whether it be political parties, unions, families, schools, could also function similarly if they were treated with care. To produce a collective was to produce its conditions of possibility to work through the effects of transference, counter-transference, resistances, and power with constant vigilance. And I'll just let end, let, end with these last words of Jean Horry, which is how he defined um, institutional psychotherapy. It's hard to translate it in English, but it, it says, ne pas laisser en passer une, to never let one go, or to never give up, right? To constantly, it was a kind of uh, you never desalinate, you're never desalinated once and for all. It's always a work in progress. So I'll end with this idea. Thank you very much. Um, we can end the PowerPoint. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Ripsis. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, um, Emily Ang, who is term assistant professor of Asian and Middle Eastern cultures at Barnard College. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for being here, sharing the screen for a moment. Um, thank you so much to the Barnard Center for Research on Women, to Miriam in particular for um, inviting me to be part of this. And thanks to Anne for acting as mo moderator for us, as thanks to ASL interpreters as well and the captioner. So a quick visual description. Um, I'm sitting in my apartment in New York City. I'm in front of a darkish brick wall, wearing a sweater that's a little bit too thick for uh, today's weather, but it's cozy. So um, if uh, Sophie and Hope, you wouldn't mind putting up the slides. Thank you. So I'll start today by reflecting for a moment on the generative phrasings and images used for our panel curated by Miriam. The title um, of the panel, Willing Subjects from Sarah Ahmed and the image from an architectural decolonization project called Return to Nature, uh, pictured here. Um, to perforate the former Israeli military buildings um, with holes in order to integrate them into the landscape while making new habitats for migratory birds to pass through and take shelter. In Ahmed's account, um, to be deemed willful, the willful woman, the willful child, is to be brimming with an excess of will beyond what might be deemed appropriate for that particular subject. And so here on the left, the willful child image from the Grimm's fairy tale that she cites, uh, whose limb refused to quiet even after death. Unlike the sense of any sense of the will that might sa be safely contained within the bounds of reason and within the bounds of an individual, um, Ahmed points out that a certain externality of the will sits um, in willfulness. Quote, they acquire life not by being or at least staying within subjects. They're not proper to subjects. So between the willful subject and the broader conference theme, living in madness, which is the poster on the right, I think from Camille's book, then comes questions of the externality of the will, um, the disintegration of uh, an alienation of self, as well as potentialities of habitation opened up by the perforation of institutions. A bit of room made maybe in between when both the subject and the institution become porous and improper to themselves. <clears throat> 
So in my own work, the paradoxes of will, madness, and, and potentiality are also central, but through somewhat different grammars. I followed ethnographically the languages and rituals of madness across psychiatry and spirit mediumship and possession in rural central China. And without getting into the literature too much, I'm using mediumship here to refer to um, kind of more sustained engagements with spirit possession that often begins with a pact with a deity or spirit rather than say a one-off run-ins with a ghost that possesses someone for a few days or a few hours, for example. And um, so both spirit mediumship and what's diagnosed as psychiatric disorders, while by no means equivalent, point to a certain externality, a certain beyond or being beside of oneself. This being beside of oneself raises questions of alienation and internal exile relevant for this panel when considered alongside histories long and short of China. And since China was never colonized by fully by external powers and has been an ever expanding global force, especially in recent decades, decolonization might not quite be the proper term. I'm thinking, for example, of Eve Tuck and Kei Wang Yang's work on um, decolonization is not a metaphor, and others who have cautioned against the quick extrapolation of colonization to mean any form of domination, and thus also to kind of confuse forms of reparations demanded or implied. But the problems posed by the threat of colonization and the delegitimization of particular forms of knowledge and particular forms of existence are not unknown in Chinese history what some Chinese intellectuals have called semi-colonialism, and in my reading are central to the understanding of psychiatry and mediumship today. And just as a side note, I've been in the process of clinical training aside, alongside my academic work, so the question of geography and what's at stake remains open to a diasporic landscape and conundrums of cultural identification, racial melancholia, and intergenerational transmission. And so I'll give a glimpse today of the field work that my book was based on, which took place in a rural county in Hunan province, pictured here in the red, um, located in the central plain region of China, which I call Hexian as a pseudonym. Once the heart of a cosmopolitical universe and home to multiple dynastic capitals, here's a Ming dynasty map from the 1400s, where the central plain region that Hunan's part of once sat in the perceived center of the world. Today, the landlocked position and heavily agricultural status of Hunan has come to be recast as left behind in a contemporary regime of value, where the urban rural, rural urban tilt of uneven symbolic material distribution sits in analog of, with that of the colony and metropole, thinking here with Raymond Williams. And so in an era of rural urban labor migration following post-Mao market reforms in the late 1970s, which concentrated capital investment in major coastal cities, Hunan province has come to epitomize not only the sense of backwardness and poverty that modern China had expired to exit, but also came to be caricaturized, caricaturized as a land of charlatans and thieves. And this image is um, of Hunan-born artist Zhang Huan in a performance piece called Family Tree. So to then zoom out further, this all comes after encounters with Western imperialism of the 19th sorry, 1800s, um, marked by the Opium Wars as well as unequal treaties that gave extraterritorial legal rights to certain foreigners in China and peppered the Chinese landscape with foreign concessions, British, French, Japanese, German, Russian, Portuguese, etc. So faced with a new world map and a new social evolutionist timeline, China would experience itself as decentered and behind. And the largely rural populace would be seen as a sign of national weakness in the failure to catch up with a modern weaponized world. So collecting these layers of history, um, later as a no man's land be between multiple fronts, as well as multiple mass famines of the 40s and 50s, um, Hunan prov province has been described by Chinese writer Ma Shuo as China of China, an internal other Ma rights, upon which those in China would externalize and impute what they imagine to be despicable about China itself about their own unbearable Chinese characteristics. And here I'm thinking also of Fanon's description of the tormenting quality of culture for those facing the aftermath of colonial disfiguration. And meanwhile, um, the practice of mediumship as a mode of healing alongside with many other aspects of tradition came under attack across the 20th century as part of the effort to modernize and thus maintain national sovereignty. And this went 
from the late 19th century edicts to repurpose temples and turn them into modern schools through anti-superstition campaigns started by the more pro-Western, pro-Christian nationalist party, followed by more thorough communist era campaigns to demolish religious infrastructure and practice altogether. Um, inspired by Marx and Feuerbach, Mao took religion to be an illusory human projection that merely perpetuated the interests of particular social classes and was thus to be abolished. So it was in this context that this of radical cosmic transformation, which would reformulate the very terms of laying claims to reality, that psychiatric and other medical institutions then entered the scene, first by way of medical missionaries, then continued by Chinese states, perceived as an apparatus necessary for modern governance. Languages of psychiatry mirrored those of anti-superstition campaigns, rendering practices like mediumship at once anachronistic, false, and mad. So with this in mind and the symbolic denigration of the rural uh, of the rural of Henan province and of mediumship itself, we now go to Hexian for a moment and enter the world of mediumship. For the spirit mediums I met in Hexian, the, uh, the actions of human beings were not fully within the jurisdiction of a self-conscious, self-transparent human subject. The body is a vessel that may be inhabited by multiple unseen entities, which may, they would say, borrow your mouth to speak or borrow your body to act. And such otherworldly communications can induce bouts of madness as well as bodily pain and other ailments. And those with soft bodies, the feminine, the ill, the very young, are more prone to be perceptive of, as well as afflicted by such presences and their signals. And while this loss of self-mastery is sort of constitutive of any mediumship practice, the loss of command over one's own actions and desires was said to grow particularly hazardous with what was described as a proliferation of duplicitous, corrupt spirits today. For the mediums I met, the abundance of demonic entities and the madness they bring are symptomatic of a particular conjunction of history, politics, and cosmos. So why psychiatric disorders? As one medium I write about in the book um, said, who I call Xi Ling as a uh, pseudonym. For instance, she said, you or I become mentally ill. We all become mentally ill. What's the aim? Before old Mao died, he said, in the future, a million madmen will storm the palace, sweep out all cow ghosts and idiotic gods. Reformulating lines from two Maoist sayings, including one that inaugurated the Cultural Revolution, for Xu Ling, the million madmen that would storm the palace refers to the contemporary moment in which deluded sinister spirits have come swirling back after Mao's death. For her, as well as other mediums, this profound corruption of the cosmos, moving away from Maoist aims of equality and toward an ever widening, widening gap between rich and poor, mutually driven by greed-filled spirits and greed-filled humans, often an account of the rise of psychiatric order, disorders today. Such spirited languages of mediumship were not limited to the site of the temple, but infiltrated or perforated, if you will, the walls of the psychiatric ward. Patients and family members swap notes on effective mediumistic healers, with family visiting spirit mediums on behalf of their children, spouses, parents, hospitalized at the ward. The medium, uh, Xu Ling, was in fact hospitalized when I met her, diagnosed with an updated version of culture-bound syndrome, itself an artifact of colonial encounter. But she continued performing her ghost-killing rituals from her hospital bed. So to close, um, one of the themes that we were asked to touch on was that of resistance. I'm not sure if I would call mediumship resistance per se because notions of a self-coincident subject that sometimes are connoted by terms like this, not psychoanalytically speaking, but um, politically or generally speaking, might get slippery when we're talking about practices like possession and mediumship. But if we return to the more unruly quality of the willful subject as not proper to itself and to the possibility of momentar momentary habitation, open up by perforations of the institution, then I might consider the co-presence of ritual and mediumistic languages and practices at the hospital and beyond as another way of rendering the walls and shapes of the institution more porous, so to speak, to other modes of existence and other modes of habitation. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Professor Ang. Um, that was wonderful. And I'm, I'm delighted now to um, introduce Lado Sheehy, who um, is an assistant professor of clinical psychology at the George Washington University's professional psychology program. Dr. Sheehy. Thanks, Anne. مساء الخير اهلا وسهلا بالجميع وشكرا لوجودكم معنا اليوم Tonight I'm beaming in from the stolen land of the Abenaki, the Samakori and Wabanaki people. Uh, I'm a light-skinned Arab cisgender woman with big curly hair. I'm wearing glasses, a choker necklace, rings and bracelets and a black brow blouse. I'm sitting in a room with big windows and wooden panels. Thank you to the BCRW, especially Miriam, Avi, Sophie, and Hope. Uh, thank you also to our interpreters and closed captioners and everyone else whose labor made this possible. Thank you, of course, to my fellow panelists whose work I've long admired, and a special thank you to my partner, Stephen, who's my partner in every way, but specific to tonight in writing our book, and he's the person who sustains my militancy. Uh, finally, solidarity with all political prisoners everywhere, especially in this settler colony in Palestine. In Can the Monster Speak, Paul Presadio punctuates his rousing call to psychoanalysts. I'm quoting, quote, my mission is the revenge of the psychoanalytic and psychiatric object in equal measure over the institutional, clinical, and, and microsystems that shore up the violence wreaked by the sexual, gender, and racial norms. We urgently need clinical practice to transition. This cannot happen without a revolutionary mutation in analysis and a critical challenge of its patriarchal colonial depositions." End quote. Psychoanalysis under occupation is an account of one such revolutionary mutation occurring in real time across Palestine by Palestinian clinicians. To map out this mutation, my partner and co-author Stephen Shihai and I engaged in a decolonial feminist solidarity building approach to work alongside our Palestinian colleagues, not as they are and were interpolated by and through settler colonial logic or what Francoise Verges terms, quote, civilizational feminism, but rather and very pertinent to today's event through what Sarah Ahmed terms being willful subjects. Heeding Ahmad, we saw in Palestine that, quote, willfulness is a diagnosis of the failure to comply with those whose authority is given and involves persistence in the face of having been brought down, end quote. It's not coincidental that a decolonial feminist style of politics guided our book. Decolonial feminist and queer methodologies and positions that affirm and that cis heteronormative patriarchal structures that include all forms of capitalism, colonialism, and settler colonialism are the problem, and they identify willfulness as a problem. We were invited into a world where Palestinian clinicians, comrades, and colleagues asserted themselves daily as defiant, unassimilatable problems, engaging in acts of refusal that alerted us to their willful self affirmation of material reality individually and communally, when they, as Nadira Shalhoub Kavirkan says, speak life, speak Palestine, and insist on the power of livability. This willfulness is produced and reproduced individually and therapeutically through clinical practice and the ways in which it embodies itself in the social practices of the political, social, collective, and individual ethos of sumud or stalwartness. Clinicians in turn produce, reproduce, and support sumud of their patients, colleagues, families, and communities. Sumud does not only reify communal bonds, but also works against neoliberal demands of individuality or psychoanalytic theories that act as arbiters of an ableist notion of health and wellness. Here, Sumud emerges as the space whereby Palestinian clinicians and their patients together forge spaces of livability, despite the ever-increasing chokeholds to, quote, that are constitutive of the Zionist settler colonial regime. 
Most importantly, as a socio-psychic practice built into clinical practice, we learn that sumud, just as in the street and in the home, is not stagnantly working towards resilience, but rather is a practice of liberation. Our Palestinian colleagues highlighted the process by which they've been forging clinical networks, self-sustained clinics and workshops, and an ethics of care, what we call the Palestinian Psychotherapeutic Commons or an indigenous Palestinian psychoanalytic praxis. One particular case shared by our comrade and friend and revolutionary feminist clinician, Yaad Ghanadri Hakim, was with her work with Amjad. Some of you may have heard this work or have read it, and yet for me, each time I speak it, I speak it anew, so I, I'm hoping you can join me in that. Amjad is a man in his early 30s who worked in an Israeli textile company inside the 1948 borders of the state now known as Israel. Though he had a home in the West Bank, Amjad, along with his three children and wife, who was a homemaker, rented a house in an officially annexed village near Kalandia out of fear of losing his identity card that allowed to live and work in Jerusalem. Amjad visited the clinic that Yuad worked at as he suffered from sensations of a lump or a ball, tabi in Arabic, in his throat whenever he became nervous. Amjad's therapy with Yuad spanned approximately 1.5 years of weekly sessions, initially supervised by an Israeli Jewish psychologist. Yad often sensed a collapse of psychic space when her Israeli supervisor, rather than being curious about the psychoanalytic meanings of Amjad's symptoms, insisted that Amjad suffered from an anxiety disorder, a behavioral disorder, and that only medication could solve his problem. Yad felt deeply conflicted by this assessment as she relayed her gut feeling or what we might read as a tuned clinical intuition, that Amjad likely had much more to say. She feared that medicine could potentially preemptively shut Amjad, his exploratory and their collaborative process down. Yad insisted that she, could, she should continue to be curious with Amjad about what he was trying to communicate in the displacement, in the counter transferential space and in the dyad attentive to the systemic meanings of his symptoms, especially under occupation. Despite her supervisor's resistance, Yuad worked with Amjad to uncover and recount all the moments in which he had felt suffocated by the ball, when his wife reminded him of payments for the pathetic car he had bought, when he passed in front of his closed house in the West Bank, when his Israeli boss asked him to bring him fresh olive oil from their tree in the West Bank, when he entered the area controlled by the Palestinian Authority, another part of his own country, and he read the sign, no crossing border, dangerous area. When Amjad started to breathe better, Yad's supervisor indicated abruptly that it was time for Yad to terminate Amjad's treatment because she felt there was no further growth or depth to explore. Yad, sensitive to the power imbalance, initially followed her supervisor's advice and told Amjad that they needed to move to termination, at which point Amjad exploded in Yad's terms, telling her she was weak and that she was, quote, not the one who owns the decision or the decision-making process. He accused her of, quote, not really being concerned with taking care of and protecting sick people, end quote. Yohad remembers being shocked, but internally very happy at the outburst, which allowed her to make the decision to continue Amjad's treatment alone without consulting her supervisor any further. During this phase of treatment, Amjad started talking about anger. More specifically, he spoke about getting angry inside his car, the lousy car in which he crossed the Kalendia checkpoint twice a day, once on his way to work and once on his way back. Amjad reported getting angry in his car whenever he read the word mabar, which translates into crossing on a sign 
He reported feeling anger because he did not feel like he was just crossing from one area to another. Rather, he felt he was inside one space, but was prohibited from free movement in another while standing at a checkpoint. This is Amjad. Why do they call it a crossing? This is a checkpoint, a checkpoint. It's a checkpoint. In a session soon after, he began to uncover his anger. Yad reminded him that they had not spoken about the ball in his throat for quite some time now. Inquiring where it was and if it remained a symptom for him. He said, sometimes I feel that there is hate or hatefulness in my throat and not a ball. This is when Yuad decided to ask him who he hated, to which he responded, I hate myself. After a moment of silence, Yuad said Amjad opened up about an incident that had happened two years prior. He reported taking his seven-year-old daughter in the morning with him on his way to work as she'd wanted to meet with a friend in Jerusalem. He remembered that his daughter was very happy that morning as she'd been fantasizing about this magical day with her friend for quite some time. He recalled that she wore a beautiful new dress and had put flowers in her hair. Amjad further shared that his daughter was singing throughout the trip in the car. Her song, Bouncy, bouncy, bouncy ball, bouncy, bouncy over the wall. When they reached the Kalendia checkpoint, Amjad was surprised to see tear gas and a confrontation between the occupation army and protesters. Worried about his daughter, he tried to reverse, but his car was stuck in the midst of hundreds of cars, all trapped. After 15 minutes, the occupation soldiers closed the checkpoint and prevented the cars from moving. All the way had hugged his daughter, who had begun to cry uncontrollably, trying to calm her and contain her fear. Eventually, she told her father she needed to use the bathroom. Amjad was not convinced that they would be allowed access to a bathroom, but his daughter's crying was escalating, and he could tell she was in considerable discomfort. Amjad told Yaad that he waved down a settler soldier, telling him, my daughter needs a bathroom. The soldiers ran towards him with their raised. He says to Yad, I raised my hands towards the sky and shouted at them, she wants a bathroom, please let me pass. The settler soldiers yelled, get back in your car, get back, get in the car, tell your daughter to piss herself in the car. All the while, his daughter continued to cry, Baba, Baba, I need a bathroom. Amjad got back in his car, hugged his daughter, and with a trembling voice told her, do it here, Baba, do it quietly here in the car. He remembered how at that moment, his daughter's screaming stopped as the smell of urine spread in the car. Amjad looked at his daughter and found her shedding silent tears. He hugged her as he drove them home. And as he looked at the checkpoint gate, he remembered the cheerful song of his daughter at the beginning of the day. Bound, bouncy over the wall. We're not you, ball. After which he immediately felt a ball stuck in his throat. Yoad is a willfully disobedient subject, as Sarah Ahmed would say. Practicing from what Sadio might say is, quote, a position of epistemological insubordination. The disobedience of a woman to become an agent of her own harm. And while we know Yuad lives a life of willful validation of Palestinian selfhood, Palestinian womanhood, and in this case, Palestinian fatherhood, in the face of brutal occupation, her willful disobedience vis-a-vis -vis her supervisor radiantly expresses willfulness as an act of affirming relationality, as a willful act of affirming and standing with Amjad, her patient. Disobedience, Ahmed tells us, is never a single atomized, individualized act, but, quote, involves a chain of actions that need to be unbroken. A political action can be what is performed to stop a chain from breaking, end quote. Yuad's willful disobedience 
is not only to say no, but to quote, repeat the no for those who cannot, for those whom she has affirmed relationality of selfhood. Yaa's decision is also an act of refusal. The act of refusal is a willful act, a positive act, and a productive act, a willful act that has become a second skin, according to Ahmad. Yaad's affirmative willful disobedience is a tooling and deploying, not only of psychoanalytic theory and practice, but also the ethics of care and of Amjad's well-being. Yaad's decision is a decolonial feminist decision, one that at once reclaims feminism, in Virgis's words, and realizes in its powerful simplicity, quote, and this is Virgis, the way in which the complex of racism, sexism, and ethnocentrism pervades all relations of domination. In that moment of refusal, Yoad will not be an agent of the state or engage in carceral discipline of herself or Amjad, but rather, rather she emerges as a radical decolonial feminist who is also a psychoanalytically informed care provider. Yaad's decision to continue working with Amjad is exhilarating because it's liberatory and liberating. She recognized his symptoms, not only the ball, but the loss of language as a hajiz, a checkpoint. She refused to stop at the checkpoint, to stop at the occupying force or enforcer's command. The recounting of the case, in fact, is punctuated by articulations of willfulness. I chose to continue treatment. She chooses not to rely on medicating him and sending him back into an abnormal world of occupation with empty language, a world where checkpoints are called crossings, where fathers cannot protect their children, a world that does not confront the illegality of settler soldiers who stop the lives of thousands in service of occupation and who make a happy seven-year-old relieve herself in her favorite dress. Yaad's act is a quiet revolutionary act, the act of refusal, which was also an act of autonomy, an autonomy that is social and communal rather than focused solely on the individual or limited to the clinical dyad. It is one that insists on indigenous presence in defiance of settler regimes, projects, and their psychoanalytic proxies. Yaad, as with all our other clinician comrades, highlight for us how their clinical work comes to be both a space for resistance for their patients and also an extension of their own resistance to their colonial hegemony. It's a collective practice unified through precisely its engagement with and maintaining life and life worlds, as well as political and historical realities for Palestinians, by Palestinians. Shukran. Thank you so much, Dr. Shihai. Um, we will hear next from um, Dr. Leah Ben Moshe, who's an interdisciplinary scholar activist working at the intersection of disability and madness, incarceration, decarceration, and abolition. Thank you. Um, thank you for the uh, amazing uh, talks um, that preceded me. Thank you for Bernard for inviting me and uh, thank you for the interpreters, the captioner um, and um, uh, everybody involved in this uh, amazing event. So uh, I'm situated in Chicago, which is on the traditional territories of the three fire people the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi, amongst others. Um, I am uh, a, a pretty pale, um, femme-looking person. I have lipstick, uh, glasses, jewelry to indicate that I'm a femme person. Uh, my hair is um, kind of like a red blonde with more and more gray in it. And um, I'm sitting in my wheelchair that has like flames behind me, uh, my background is a blurred background of a bookcase. And what I want to offer uh, for you today 
his uh, some remarks about the body and mind politics or the connection between the national body and the disabled mad body, basically about the difference that disability and madness makes uh, going off um, Lara's amazing talk about acts of, of refusal from the, the subjects of, of psychiatry. Um, in, in that case, Amjad, but I wanna bring a kind of more collective light to it. So uh, all of my work tries to speak to the nexus of the carceral and therapeutic and how they're connected to each other. So really to speak about the entanglement of the carceral and therapeutic nation state. My aim is to broaden what gets to be defined as carceral. When we say carceral, we often think about um, surveillance, we think about uh, prisons um, and so on, but we don't always think about uh, psychiatrization or institutionalization of people with intellectual disabilities. Um, and I really appreciated that the talk started, uh, Camille started with eugenics, which was, of course, you know, the core of some of these um, practices. The entanglement of the carceral with the therapeutic is, of course, a racial and gendered project. Um, and this is what I call uh, in uh, my work uh, racial criminal pathologization, which is a discourse that um, you know, we can trace from eugenics um, to contemporary uh, discussions and acts of police sanctioned murder, for example, in the um, uh, diagnosis, quote unquote, of excited delirium, for example. Uh, this um, entanglement of the carceral and therapeutic is also spreads across countries and continents, of course. So I have three points for you today, no slides, three points. Uh, I wanna talk about how discussing all of this without talking about disability and madness is problematic for three reasons. And I'll give examples for each. One is it avoids an understanding of disability and madness as an analytical category. Second, it, you know, it's really important then to understand disability and madness as a way to view the world as a lived experience. And third, um, I'll talk about why it's important to understand disability and madness um, as a freedom struggle. So my first point is that uh, it's really important to understand disability and madness as an analytical category. And you know, I come from the field of disability and med studies and so, for example, you know, if we take um, the the uh, talk that um, was just presented, um, some of the work that I and other people do uh, looks at how, uh, for example, disability can be viewed historically as the antithesis antithesis of um, Zionist uh, ethoses, because. Um, it was seen as a remnant of a diasporic weak Jew of the past. So Zionism as the ideology that created um, 1948 Israel is an ideology that thought to transform Jewishness into a national identity, but also a national body type and a national kind of mind type. So um, one of the things that's really you know, important uh, and what I'll talk about throughout um, my remarks is that reclaiming disability can be very trans transformative and it can move us towards true liberatory resistance to the occupation and other forms of dominance, state repression, colonialism, and so on. So if you remember just one thing out of what I'm going to say is that of course, um, madness is produced by horrific things like colonialism, uh, militarization, racism, uh, police violence, and so on. But that should be prevented by the abolition of those forces, the abolition of colonialism, the abolition of nation states, not the dream of the abolition of disability and madness. So resisting militarization and colonialism should always be on the agenda of disability med activists and so on. Uh, and I think Sophie's gonna uh, put something in the chat um, to uh, a, a manifesto of sorts um, to bring that uh, important point. 
the violence of colonialism, occupation, military aggression, though, does not only cause impairment and disabling environments, but also renders disability endemic and unremarked. So in other words, um, imprisonment, occupation, um, and also I wanna say activism against races, racism, against occupation, um, it's full of trauma, uh, it's very disabling, it's very maddening, but disability or madness shouldn't be articulated only through the lens of pathology. Disability or madness is also an entry point. It's not just uh, an end point. I guess my question is what happens once the disability comes or the disability or madness is here? So disability or madness is an entry point into a community, into a culture with a rich history of resistance, of art, of transgression, and of course also of oppression, premature death, and so on. So disability and madness is not just an end point, but for some it's also an entry into another site of struggle. So madness disability in that sense is generative of um, subjugation and of subjectivity. Disability is a politicized identity for some of us. Um, you know, not all of us who have impairments or disability are politicized as disabled. One actually needs to learn to be disabled or mad politically. Just like not all gays are queer, right? Um, and use it subvers subversively. So the problem with discussion of disability that are only on the level of biopolitics or the necropolitics of debilitation and do not look at disability as a cultural phenomena or as a politics um, that articulates, a, articulates difference. The problem with that is that we are left with prevention and rehabilitation or assimilation discourses as the only available frameworks, which really forecloses more liberatory possibilities. And one, um, I'm gonna give two examples um, and then uh, I'll end. Um, one is that uh, one example of activating subjugated knowledges of disability and madness is that disability, med studies, indigenous studies, uh, prison abolition, all share a critique of rehabilitation. They share a critique of disciplining the way we discipline bodies and minds, share a critique of normalization that's done through the process of so-called civilizing people which of course has very strong colonial roots. In some, they are all epistemologies that are against corrections, whether the correction is done by the so-called correction industry, a criminal justice system, or by physical, psychiatric, behavioral rehabilitation and modification that are pushed on people who are considered quote unquote abnormal. So this is really, you know, an example of activating these subjugated knowledges. Um, and in North America, of course, this uh, trend continued uh, as an attempt to assimilate indigenous communities through boarding schools, training schools, and then continuing on in prisons. My second example uh, with which I will end um, is the way that disability and madness histories are a part of longer freedom struggles. For example, in my work, I talk a lot about uh, deinstitutionalization or what can be gained by basically politically or politically reclaiming disability and madness. What can be regained is understanding the history um, in the US and Canada of the process we call deinstitutionalization which for those who don't know is the transition of people with psychiatric or and intellectual disabilities from state institutions and hospitals into community living. But this was not just a process, but really a logic, a framework, a movement, and it had a lot of abolitionary strands within it. And the reason why it's important is because for a lot of us abolitionists, um, we are told, oh, prison abolition, carceral abolition, it can't actually happen. But it did happen, it happened already. It happened in the US, it happened in Canada. There's a precedent for it in the form of deinstitutionalization. And it happened because of many factors, including because people pushed for it. 
including whistleblowers in uh, prisons, uh, in, in uh, institutions, in um, uh, psychiatric facilities, and so on. And that kind of knowledge deconstruct the more hegemonic narrative of deinstitutionalization. And the hegemonic narrative is about, you know, uh, mental illness, curing mental illness, um, debunking that knowledge would necessitate us understanding how uh, madness was transformed into mental illness in the words of uh, Foucault. So the story of deinstitutionalization um, is incredibly uh, important. And I wrote a whole, you know, 300 page book about that, if people are interesting, uh, interested. But what I want to uh, say in closing about this is that, um, you know, th the story of deinstitutionalization is also a story about the retrenchment of biopsychiatry. Uh, so biopsychiatry hasn't disappeared, it just moved elsewhere. Um, biopsychiatry is, uh, you know, the only form uh, really of, of um, psychiatry that's recognized uh, in the U.S. in terms of uh, medical practice, um, insurance, uh, and so on. So I want to end here with a cautionary tale about the, um, what we were asked, the afterlife of resistance. So the cautionary tale around the afterlife of the institutionalization. So I started um, my brief remarks by talking about the entanglement of the carceral and the therapeutic state. Uh, and that entanglement continues on to today. Uh, and it's not just old power in new clothes, but their intersection today in so-called alternatives to psychiatrization. What happens once the institution, not just the walls come down, but the whole institution comes down, right? And I mean, the physical uh, institution, the psychiatric hospital and so on. Uh, what happens then? And what happens then, it's what's happening now, which is new forms of psychiatrization are colluded with um, forms of incarceration. For example, mental health jails, uh, so-called treatment inside uh, prisons, but also um, what happens outside of cages, right? So a lot of people say, well, people with mental health differences, they don't deserve to be in prison. And then people advocate for their psychiatrization, which anti-psychiatry activists and med activists tell us is a form of um, surveillance, surveillance that is a form of carcerality. It's not an alternative to carcerality, it's actual carcerality. Um, what happens now is new forms of chemical incarceration, uh, treatment, community treatment, drug orders, me meaning you don't wanna be psychiatrist, will come to your house and you have to take pills. Um, this is going on. Psychiatric confinement instead of imprisoning, uh, drug courts, all of this is what I call uh, carceral ableism and carceral sanism, which is the praxis and belief that people with disabilities, mental health differences, need special or extra protections in ways that often expand and legitimate our further marginalization and our further incarcer incarceration. So in closing, you know, this use of pathologization of disability, of mental health, of substance use, uh, and protection from unruliness, which is of course colonial and racist, should not be used as justification for carceral expansion. Um, and you know, the last thing I would say, this is why we need to focus on disability and madness as an epistemology, as a framework from which to create social change. We cannot create social change by um, you know, uh, staying in, in kind of ableist uh, practices that only look at disability and madness as something to be fixed and as a deficit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I think all the panelists will be coming back in now. I'm checking out the clock here. So I think we've got about 15 minutes for conversation, questions. I would invite members of the audience, um, if you want to put a question into the comment box, I'm keeping my eyes on that. But um, just preliminarily, these were 
four really astonishing presentations. And one thing I heard that sort of seemed to cut across all four of them was something uh, kind of like an, a move towards the undisciplining of subjectivity, right? So we, you know, we heard about acts of refusal, right? From subjects of psychiatry, um, um, the, the notion of the willful act that becomes a second skin, the will, willful disobedience, um, a mediumship that is also a kind of being beside of oneself. Um, uh, we also heard about sort of this, you know, practices of disalienation, a literal sort of trying to tumble down the walls. And it struck me that there's something in all of these that let's pushing back against these disciplining knowledge forms, psychiatry, psychoanalysis, psychology, again, to sort of undisciplined subjects to open up other possibilities. So I just, I, I just wondered, right, maybe if you could speak some more about this. I think there's, you know, this question, a lot of you quoted Paul Preciado's uh, recent sort of book pamphlet manifesto, Can the Monster Speak? And it seems to me that all of you are also asking the question, well, but can the analyst, can the psychiatrist, can, can we all listen, right? Can we attend, not just listen, but attend? Um, what I'll say, Anne, is that, you know, can, can we listen, can we attend, and can we disrupt? Can we disrupt in ways, I mean, the, the work throughout our, our work, whether historically or, or currently, uh, that document how people disrupt the disciplining of their bodies, of their minds, of their being, of their subjectivity? Um, and, and can we join them in that disruption? And I'm speaking as a clinician now too, right? Not just an academic, is that how does one join in disrupting uh, what Liat was just talking about, you know, it's not just enough to do, it's, it, we need to disrupt the logics, otherwise it reinforces itself all over again. The walls come down and then what do we have, you know, and I, I, I hear that a, a, across the board. So I, I'm also interested in this question of, of disruption, of how do we um, create conditions in which people can uh, rise up to the disruption, the sort of revolu revolutionary potential within themselves already, rather than us quash that out of our own inter internalized disciplinary uh, processes, whether whether trickle down from our institutions or our trainings or through ableism or through all the ways in which we are complicit in disciplining bodies and minds, right? If, to, to Fanon's point, when we become confusion mongers, we, we're, the, we're the confusion mongers in this. I mean, I think that um, Liat brought, I think in some sense, uh, and Liat, I wonder, want to invite you maybe to say more about this. I was, I, I think that maybe you and Camille can, can talk to each other a bit because Camille, this, the idea that the literal taking down of the walls, right? The elimination of, of also the, the, the barriers between the cells so to have an open space. And one of the things that Liat's also pointing out that the, the deinstitutionalization, the breaking down of the walls in a different way has led to now, you know, it's sort of well, power regroups. And now with biopsychiatry, you don't need different kinds of walls or different kinds of practices. So I'm even thinking about the disruption that stops being disruptive after a certain time. Yeah, um, thank you for your uh, question, uh, and and I think um, you know I don't want it to sound like this kind of uh, purely like uh, the Luzian, um, you know, the new societies of control, which he wrote already in the old societies of control, like the nineties. Um, but I, I really do think there's something um, similar and different, and you know, I, I think we need to be very. Uh, I always think and write, you know, as, as a scholar activist who is not just embedded like in the movements, but, you know, it, in the movements, right? Um, that it's really important to notice like what's different also. Um, and um, what is different is that deinstitutionalization was fought for by a lot of forces, including neoliberalism, right? Like Reagan, who wanted to just cl close shit down and not give money to anything else, community mental health centers or, or anything really. Um, but also it was fought for by people. 
um, who were incarcerated and their families and physicians and nurses and, you know, other people that were basically like whistleblowers and, you know, um, imploded these places from within. Um, so it's really important that not to not to kind of um, be complicit with this backlash to the institutionalization and to say, OK, that now just manifested in this like new clothes, which is, you know, chemical incarceration, all that. I, I hope I hope it makes sense that that's not what I was saying, because people fought, people won. And their gain is that for the majority of people, for example, with intellectual disabilities that are being born today with intellectual disability, the first line of thought is not let's institutionalize. And you know how huge a win is this? It's a, it's a win of the mind, like Lara was saying. I mean, this is a discursive shift. And this happened because people fought. So I, I don't want to like lose sight of like that point. Um, and, and I also want to bring like to the surface, you know, in relation to your first question about disciplining, um, that there's a whole, you know, discipline here, like disability studies, mad studies, who, uh, embodies, you know, that kind of, um, subversive subjectivity uh, the writing from the inside, right? The writing of, of the institutionalized and the mad and the, um, you know, uh, 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 and, and so forth. Yeah. I can just add something to, to um, bouncing on what you, you you were saying, Leah, and, and Anne's question. I think one of the really interesting um, uh, kind of threads in this conversation that I've that I've been thinking about is whether um, you know kind of the role of the institution in this. What because so the the people that I'm studying ultimately think that the institution that you need institutions right for psychic and so social. Um, uh, <clears throat> Just kind of coherence, if you'd like, and so that 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 um, so D, so, so they were very much, and this is where they kind of parted ways with anti psychiatry. Is that they? It was not about closing the hospitals; it was about keeping them, but reforming them from within. So I think there's an interesting potential conversation here that maybe we can have at some point uh, later. But but um, you know about whether the goal is to kind of the deinstitutionalization, or whether you can kind of figure out how to transform the institutions from within because it, you know that it, it goes back to kind of what you were saying is that they the that is that all of them have this potential to be recuperated right everything it can be deinstitutionalization can be recuperated by neoliberalism it can be so so anything and, and this is what um i think the institutional psychotherapists are very much aware of is, is how can we this is going to happen right it's things are politics are going to get recuperated uh, madness is going to get recuperated. Everything will get recuperated. But then, can we kind of find ways to to continue this kind of permanent? They call it a permanent revolution, right, of the mind and of politics at once. But I don't, you know, I don't have an answer. I'm a historian. I look back at the past, but I think it's something interesting to think about for 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 moving forward. You know, I mean, Emily, one of the things that one of the things that I think um, I was thinking about with your presentation, and I and I think it also is it has really interesting connections with the other presentations, and you brought the anti-superstition campaigns, and you said that these, in some sense, were inspired by Marx and Feuerbach, but then they got mirrored by the kind of use of psychiatry and sort of medical knowledges. And what that got me thinking about the ways in which, you know, basically the role of secularisms, you know, certainly plural, but how some of these practices of psychiatry are deeply embedded in, sort of invested in a, a, a refusal of a kind of, a, of different cosmologies. Um, that, that doesn't have to be the case necessarily, but certainly historically. And I guess I wondered if you could say a little bit more, because I think you importantly get in, uh, this is maybe a, a, a too flat a term in the, in the context in which you're working, but you get in questions of religion or spirituality that um, have a kinship potentially with madness. Right? I don't want to reduce, but there's something really exciting about what you're sort of pushing, uh, uh, links you're pushing. Yeah, thank you so much, Anne, for that. I think you know, as I, I'm just kind of absorbing what everyone else is saying and kind of trying to place, you know, China has such a specific and complicated relationship to, just think about that, the poster that was used for the conference, I believe is drawn from Camille's book. And I think that the original caption said something, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but something along the lines of um, the bourgeoisness of psychiatry as repairing workers rather, you know, I, I apologize, but I'm butchering it. But and in China, psychiatry and psychology were banished for be being bourgeois practices under Maoism, but it turned into a really intense form that 
a lot of people also suffered under. So there, you know, there are just, there are a lot of layers to them, what it means to respond to um, psychiatric institutionalization. And then the kind of mix between the sense that there's a lack of access to care, which of course folds back into the discourse of need for more institutions and something else. And so I think that my work with mediums kind of at least, you know, I, and I don't know because I feel like my work is a little bit, you know, to the side of the direct question of the institution. It's more, there are particular engagements with madness that still exist outside of the languages um, that have tried to fold them in. And also kind of quite literally face to face in the sense that where I work, there was a circulation of people between the temple and the hospital and with very different languages and practices of what happens to one and what it means, what these symptoms actually register. And so, um, you know, I, I don't think, you know, it's not necessarily uh, some kind of romantic return to religion or something like that, but it's a question of other modes of thought that and, and inhabiting the body and the psyche that become closed off um, when certain, um, you know, if one wants to call it secular, certain modes of thinking about individuation um, take hold and become very difficult to think out of. So I guess my hope for offering that little snippet was just to think, I think also what Leah was saying, think from modes of being that are not self-contained, whether it's madness or possession or something in which one is already out of um, a certain, you know, rational bound itself. And where, what if we begin from there as a kind of question? I mean, it seems to me you're also talking about uh, uh, cultivating different, m cultivating and attending to already existing modes of reception, right? That sort of are not about the sort of individuated selves in the same way. You know, right. uh, uh, mind, yeah, mindful of time, a question that's come up several times in the comment box, and it's, um, is what would you as practitioners, as activists, as teachers, what, you know, quick, you know, like how how are we to go about cultivating willful subjects, disobedient subjects? As if you have a quick blueprint up your sleeve right now. <laughs> I love that. This is this is a I love Anne's questions. Um, so th this might go back to Camille's point about perpetual revolution, right? Is that I think to commit ourselves to that. This is not you know, it, it's not easy work. It's not, revolution is not sexy <laughs> all the time. It's doing the hard work um, of, and, and, and not in an ableist sense, but together in community. How do we continuously relate to each other in, in an abolitionist way and really commit to being abolitionists too, right? Which means in our politics, in our relationships, in our everyday um, dealings in our classrooms, in our training clinics. What does that mean? If we're sort of calling a, a Lauren Berlant um, in, in, into the room of how do we imagine and reenact the world that we want to be in all the time, right? And, and that means committing to solidarity building. That means um, upending logics, uh, upending the sort of uh, the centrality, let's say, of a uh, of a colonial system that means decentering the United States as an imperial power. That means uh, sort of speaking to settler colonial logics at every turn, whether that's in the the country now known as the United States or Canada or Israel or wherever it is. And I think we we need to be in this fight, right? Because our, if we're calling on folks to be willful subjects, we can't also um, sit back and and do these things in metaphor. Emily, you brought up, you know, Tuck and, and Yang's um, a, a concept, right? Decolonization is not a metaphor. I don't think our action or our commitment to abolition and to these movements can also be metaphorical. We really need to be showing and thinking through together in solidarity about what that looks like, the, the redoing, undoing, remaking of worlds and worldliness constantly. Other thoughts. I, I also want to let people know here, here, um, uh, watching this event, um, listening to this event unfold live, we're going to stay an extra 10 minutes. So we have time for a little bit more of a lushness of this conversation. Um, one of the 
terms that appeared across all of your presentations had to do with the issue of space, I mean, literal space. I mean, we started off with Camille, brought us into the architecture. We were actually in the mud, right? And then we were taken into architecture. But this question of space came up throughout, um, spaces of resistance, spaces, the crossing point of extraordinary um, vignette from the, the clinical work with Lada shared with us, right? Deinstitutionalization is about exiting, uh, um, sort of leaving actual spaces, um, the spaces in between um, that Emily is describing and, and her research. And I'm um, looking at some comments in the, in the comment box and how do we think about, can we think about spaces that become um, sort of hybridized? Like uh, one of the issues I'm looking at a comment from Steve Knobloch, like the, the ways the siloing of so many of these, of, of the practices that you're in some sense arguing in conversation with and arguing against. So how do we sort of make spaces that have more let's say, permeable boundaries. Like, so, it, so there can in fact be border crossings. And maybe, maybe, maybe it shouldn't even be borders, right? But <laughs> maybe that's another conversation. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I think, I think we're all kind of like, your questions are so then that we don't even want to like nullify them with an answer because they'll be not as good as the question because the question is what we really need to think about. I mean, that is the question, right? Um, if we had the answers, we would already do it. Um, and I think some some people are, uh, of course, but, um, you know, to, to, to kind of, you know, speak briefly about this. I mean, this is why it's really important to talk about these like intersections and nexus, you know, to bring more spatial um, concepts like into the table is because we we have to confront it coalitionally. Um, so, you know, there's like two strategy. One is to understand that everybody else's freedom is bound up with yours, you know, um, the whole uh, black freedom, you know, kind of struggle and dream. Um, but also uh, if, um, if that's not possible to at least understand that, you know, the oppression is connected, right? What intersectionality kind of uh, gets us to. And, you know, this is why I spoke at the beginning about a cultural therapeutic nexus, because it's really important to like live in that intersection. Uh, I mean, as an activist, um, of course, also as a scholar, but, you know, to live in that intersection as an activist means to like fight this um, is to live in the hybrid. And, and sometimes to live in the hybrid or the hyphen or the in-between, um, you know, is, uh, I'm not the person who coined this, but, you know, somebody said that, some, you know, being in an intersection sometimes means you get run over. I mean, that's the, right, that's the, um, the danger. But um, I don't see any other way, you know, it's, it's to, and this is exactly what you mean about the access, right? Like the madness, the... Um, you know, the, the disability, it's to live in the access, is to live in the in the more than or less than or the, you know, and so on and so on. And, and I think that that's a very subversive, actually, position to, to embody. Can I say something, too? I think in relation to, this might go back to your previous question more than space, but I'm taking a second to, to, to come up with answers to these excellent questions. Um, but I think one of the, the themes that runs through all of our talks is also uh, just the centrality of the psyche in all political processes, which is, again, something that I don't think we should take for granted because, um, uh, you know, this is something that I found. I, I wrote, for example, this my book, um, much of it I wrote during the Trump years. And it was very interesting to see the kind of inability of both liberalism and a kind of more vulgar Marxism to deal with something like, like Trumpist politics, right? To think about the problem of libidinal politics, of transference, of identification, of all of the kinds of the issues that I was trying to point to in the talk. And I think it's interesting to to you know, for, for for that for liberals kind of dismiss the unconscious as this thing, the kind of pathology, right? And then uh, and then a kind of more vulgar Marxist approach will say, well, it's a displacement of a more accurate reality, whether it be class or or or, or global capital or something like that. And I think the the five presentations here show that it's um that the psyche really it's not so easy to place it in a particular. Um, category of analysis and it often disrupts things but it produces i think much really interesting frames of analysis that are that are badly needed to think of 
the present um, and to understand our political reality. So that's that's um, some thoughts. <laughs> but you know what's wonderful about what you just, well, so much is wonderful about what everyone has said, but, but Camille, in particular, what I'm hearing is, you know, that resistance, right? The double of resistance. There's the resistance, which we think of in sort of political terms, and then the resistance, which is a keyword in, within psychoanalysis. And that, you know, in some sense, I want to say, I want I was about to say, thank God or goddess for the unconscious. So that then we have to say tangent, which version of the unconscious, but back to my story, right? Thank God for the unconscious, because we could think of it as a kind of, you know, sort of like a, a space of resistance to the too quick, here comes the social stories over, right? It is, we could think of it as a kind of engine for excess, though that doesn't necessarily lead to good things, right? This is, there's, there's a political neutrality to what, ex, to excess. Right. That's Trump's right. the excess of Trumpism. It might not be, you know, not my cup of tea. That's right. And there isn't going to be a single um, cure for the unconscious, right? They're never going to find <laughs> one single pill, one single part of the brain, one single diagnosis because of this question of resistance. So I think that's in some ways also goes back to the question of willful subjects, right? Willful subjects are also subjects of the unconscious. <laughs> The bad news, no cure for the unconscious. That's also the good news. I think one of the most moving things that we, we saw in Palestine is, again, to go back to this, is that nobody on the ground is confused about this, right? And I think it's it's a, a, upon us kind of in conversations like this, but also in movement cross solidarity movements like Liat was sort of bringing forth is to support those efforts, is to support those efforts by by any means necessary, really, in terms of the community building that folks are doing, folks that have inherited categories of, of lessness, let's say, to have spaces to create their own liberation by their own hands for their own people with their own indigenous tools, right? Without our sort of, you know, wanting to rehabilitate that in some way is to, I think part of the liberatory process is no longer having to rely on the colonial tools or the, or, or the logics of oppression in the way that has so long been continued, right? Is to sort of come in and be like, no, this, these, these practices of being a medium, for example, are my practices to be a medium for this particular way. And I'm no longer relying on science in a particular way, or I'm no longer relying on the settler colonial regime to come train me. I'm saying I'm making a psychotherapeutic commons in Palestine for Palestinians by Palestinians. And how do we sort of join in that, in imagining these worlds together with people and in enacting them as well? I'm mindful. I know we, we've gone at 10 minutes over, but we've got 60 seconds left. All right, precious time. Does anyone have like a concluding, maybe just question in some sense? I, 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 in, in, this is this is a panel in the spirit of questions. Uh, questions also launched today by Miriam and, and Avi, about, for which I think we're all grateful. I would I say gonna... immense, immense gratitude, but not just for the panel, but for the whole conference theme. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I know uh, Miriam probably going to talk about the next panels, but I am so looking forward to those <laughs> as well. And and just you know, taking up this theme, like I really, um, you know, commend Bernard for for kind of like doing not just a one off, um, you know, thing, but really a sustained effort to really engage with these deep questions around the, the difference that madness makes. Um, so yeah, thank you for uh, letting um, me and us be a part of it. Thank you Miriam, for putting us all together. Oh, it has been such a pleasure to see you all in conversation and to see the, the ways that your, your work and your remarks weave together so beautifully. Um, uh, what I've prepared to say is that you've made explicit how acts of willful subjectivity, refusal and unruliness, um, and self-liberation self are present 
and persistent inside, outside, in spite of institutions, um, the institutions that are enacting and supporting the violence of settler colonial, neoliberal and ra racial capitalist projects, um, that willfulness is not defeated. <laughs> um, and I feel more hopeful after hearing your words. Um, and I just wanna thank all of you for pushing us and pushing us toward the importance of activating subjugated knowledge, Liat, and reclaiming disability as a tool of decolonization and shed a ideology and language. And to all of you for reminding us to resist cutting off the many ways of being that we have access to, um, reminding us to remain in the power of our psyche and to remain invested in each other's liberation um, and uphold the, the kind of world we wanna live in. Um, this was just very powerful. Um, I imagine we'll all be going back to the recording. Um, I want to now invite everyone to join us for the rest of our series, including the Silver Science Lecture we have next um, in two weeks, Tuesday, March 8th at 6.30 with Dr. Helena Hansen, whose, title, whose talk is entitled, White Out, How Racial Capitalism Changed the Color of Heroin in America. Um, and our staff will be providing the links to those future events in the in the comment area. Um, and before I forget, I want to uh, thank you, Anne, for keeping this conversation moving and bringing your your uh, humor and insight to it as well. Um, it's just been very beautiful, um, and I expect the rest of our events to also be um, exciting. So I invite everyone who is here tonight to join us for those. Um, and finally, we encourage you to read our panelists' work, um, visit the bookstore, our bookstore partner, Word, Word Up Books, um, and visit the Barnard Library if you have access, um, or to any university library. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Please come back.